Thank you. Good morning. How's everyone this morning? Really? <laughs> You're not too convincing. <laughs> God is so good. I hope you all had a really good week. Um, I had a good week. I was able to go fishing with my best fishing buddies, and we had a great time. Um, I like the simple things of life, and I always see God's beauty out in the outdoors. So we enjoy our company, too, and our fellowship. So, hey, let's just prepare for the Holy Spirit just to enter in and to anoint the service, the message, the word, the music, and uh, invite him to come in. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity we have this morning to worship you. Thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace, and your love for us. Lord, we just invite you in the presence of your Holy Spirit to just indwell us this morning and have your way. May we understand what you have us here for this morning. May we hear your still small voice. Take the distractions away this morning. Help us just to focus on the presence of the Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you for Wayne this morning. I just ask that you would anoint him as he speaks, anoint worship this morning, and the worshipers as well. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. If you could all please stand. <coughs> if you want. <laughs>
dismissed. Thank you, kind sir. I appreciate that. It is such a joy for me to be back with you. Thank you for the invitation to come back and speak and share the Word of God. And we're going to be looking at Colossians chapter 1, so I invite you to take your Bible and turn there. And while you're turning, last month when I was here, I didn't show any slides, and several of you said, you know, where were your slides? (laughs) So I have some slides today. So if we could have the first slide up here. Uh, Again, just... uh, Some things about me and I guess things that I enjoy. Um, If you go down I-5 going into California, if you go south of Redding, you'll come to Mount Shasta. And that is Mount Shasta there. And back in, I'm not sure when it was, my climbing partner and I uh, decided to do that. Next slide. So there there I am on top. Uh, It was a really extremely cold morning, colder than what I was expecting. And uh, so if you've ever climbed any kind of summit at all, it's always great to be on top because you get this pyramid shape uh, sunrise shadow that comes. And uh, so I really enjoy that. If it looks like I'm holding on for dear life, I am holding on for dear life. I really don't like heights. And uh, right behind us, it just, I know that sounds funny, doesn't it? But right behind us, it just dropped off. I don't know, maybe 800 feet, 1,000 feet just dropped off. And so I'm kind of hanging on there telling my partner, quick, take the picture, you know. So that's on on Mount Shasta. Next slide. That is my wife and I at Glacier National Park. We enjoyed traveling, my wife Laura, and uh, just enjoyed going to different parks. Next next slide. That was taken in uh, Glacier National Park. Next slide. Um, That is when, let's see, I'm on Mount Rainier when I took that. And I was just hiking along, and there was this fox not too far away, and kind of just posed for me and let me take some pictures. And uh, so I enjoy wildlife photography. Next slide. Um, That is my wife and I in South Africa. This was in uh, 2006. That was the the last trip my wife took with me uh, before she passed away. And and, uh, we weren't sure whether she was going to go or not, uh, but she felt strong enough. And so we were with missionaries, the divorce. Uh, we're in Cape Town, South Africa. Next slide. Um, that is my wife in the middle, my two daughters. Uh, this is kind of the last, last of things on these slides. This was the last Christmas that uh, we spent before my wife passed away. And uh, so my youngest daughter on my right, she is a nurse at uh, Sacred Heart Hospital. And my daughter on my left is the oldest. And uh, she owns her own accounting business, um, also living in Spokane Valley. So that's where I live, Spokane Valley. I retired from Montana, moved back because I have both my daughters are there, my grandkids are there. And right now, my daughter on the right, my youngest daughter, um, they've adopted a boy. They're in the foster care system. So they've adopted little Corbin. They have his sister now, and she's a little over a year and a, year and a half old. And now my daughter is pregnant. And uh, so I'm expecting my sixth grandchild in. Uh, July. And uh, if you ever do remember us in prayer, I would appreciate you remembering my daughter in prayer. Uh, They've recently found out that uh, um, they're going to have a little boy, uh, but they have some heart problems with this little boy. They found out that he has Down syndrome. And so as you uh, uh, remember them, I just would appreciate you praying for them. Uh, My daughter and her son in the foster care, taking foster care kids in, um, they have taken in special needs kids. And so my oldest grandson of theirs um, has some special needs. He was born, I'm not sure what the terminology is, but his organs are flip-flops. So your heart is on your left, his is on his right. And uh, so he has some special needs. So now they're going to have another special needs. And so I just would ask if you remember us and all that, you might remember them in prayer. Next slide. This is my wife um, hiking. This was in, 
I think this was in 2005, and uh, probably the last real hike that she did with me. This is at Pinnacle Peak, and you can see obviously Mount Rainier in the background, and she was feeling really good this year, and uh, got back into hiking with me, and uh, Pinnacle Peak I think was really the last it's not a strenuous hike, but strenuous for her. And uh, next slide. So this is kind of going up on Pinnacle Peak. Next slide. This was in just after Labor Day sometime. So you can see all the colors. Um, Mount Rainier, one of my favorite subjects to take pictures of. Next slide. This was in the springtime uh, on Mount Rainier. Next slide. Again, just kind of a, I'm not sure when that was, sometime in the spring. And I think that's the last slide maybe. Yeah. So again, just some fun things about me and I enjoy photography. And when I lived over here on the west side, it was great to be close to uh, Mount Rainier and to spend so much time up there. We're in Colossians chapter one this morning. And uh, in light of communion, I thought I would do a message based around our communion time in whom we have redemption. And as you, as you look at your outline, just a little bit about the background as we look at this. I enjoy going through the scriptures and looking at prayers of the Bible. And in Colossians chapter 1, we find one of, I think, Paul's most powerful prayers. And I want to look at that just for a moment. And you'll see it on your outline. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. Paul says, for this reason also, since the day we heard of it. Heard of what? Well, if we go back up to verse 3. We read this, verse 3, we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. That's what Paul had heard of. You know, word had filtered through and it had come to Paul about these Colossian believers. And he's hearing, hearing of their faith. He's hearing of their love, which they have for all the saints. I mean, wouldn't it be great if Community Bible Fellowship, if the word just got out through Kettle Falls and Colville and crossed the river up to Evans and um, over going towards Republic and the word is just filtered out as people were hearing of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. I mean, what a wonderful testimony that is. Well, word had come to Paul, verse 5, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth. Well, as we come down to verse 9, since we heard of your faith, since we heard of your love towards the saints, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, pleasing him in all respects. And he goes on. Well, as you really begin to look at all of this, notice Paul's prayer. Really, what was it? His prayer is very short. It's very succinct. His prayer is this, that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Now, I would encourage you to be praying for each other during the course of the week. I, I don't know if you have a systematic way of being able to do that, but you ought to. And as you pray for one another, I say unfortunately, but it is necessary that we pray for each other for health, for all kinds of things. But sometimes if you're not sure how to pray for your brother or sister, take this. This is so powerful. What did Paul pray? Look what he prayed. Here it is, very short, very succinct. He prayed that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Do you want to pray for one of your brothers or sisters in Christ this morning? Pray that. Pray that they might be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Notice the reason. Why do you pray that? So that. Anytime you're reading your Bible and you come across those two words, so that, you need to stop, figure out, okay, what is it there for? I underline mine usually, so that. Here's the reason. It's giving a reason. He is praying specifically. I'm praying that you might be filled with the knowledge of God's will. And the reason I'm praying this is so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Oh, beloved. I mean, do you see how exciting that is? I mean, do you realize how that will transform your church as you begin praying that for each other? At your heart, 
the reason you're praying this prayer is so that these people that you're praying for are going to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Imagine if Community Bible Fellowship had 75% of your church family walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. Now, I'm saying 75, I know you're saying, well, why not 90? Well, why not 90? You know, we ought to look at it that way. We ought to be praying for each other. So if I want you to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, then I'm going to pray this. I'm going to pray that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will, because that's how you're going to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. I mean, who of us here this morning doesn't want to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord? I mean, none of us would say that. So here's a prayer. Today, this week, as you begin praying for each other, pray. Lord, I pray for Bob, Susie, whoever it is, that they might be filled with the knowledge of your will. Now, we'll talk about this in just a moment. How do you get to be filled with the knowledge of God's will? Study the scriptures. Study, study, study the scriptures. And you will be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Why? Because my heart is I want you to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. I mean, imagine the transformation, not in just this church, but imagine the transformation in Kettle Falls. If they're seeing all these people walking around in Kettle Falls, walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. Well, you know, how does that happen? Glad you asked. Paul tells us how to do that. I love Paul because usually when he, when he gives us something, he gives us how to do it. So all of you... English majors here, look what we have. Here's what he's saying in verse 9. I'm praying that you would be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Now he clarifies it. In all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So he comes down and he quantifies it. This is how you're going to do that. I'm praying that so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. After he gives that, he's going to give five participles. An easy way to find a participle oftentimes is by the ing ending at the end of the word. Oh, okay. So how, how am I going to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord? Verse 10, to please him in all respects. Now our English is a little bit different but the Greek, from the Greek, but in the Greek it would be this way. Pleasing him in all respects. Pleasing would have the ing. It's a participle. Oh. So if I'm going to walk worthy of the Lord, one thing I know that, that does that is if I'm pleasing to him in all respects of my life, that helps me walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. So you stop and you think, okay, I'm going to look back at my life and say, all right, this week was I pleasing in all aspects of my life to the Lord. That's really a yes or no answer, right? Well, you know, no. Was I pleasing or not? It's that simple. So in my life today, as we leave here in just a little while, one of the things that I have to be saying is, Lord, help me to be pleasing to you in all things. And when I am pleasing, I'm going to be walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. See how that works? So the first ING, the first participle is pleasing to the Lord. Look at secondly, in verse 10, what's the next ING ending that you see in your Bible? Bearing, bearing fruit. Now I'm reading out of the New American, so yours might be a little bit different, but mine is bearing fruit. So I'm pleasing him in everything, in all respects. Secondly, I'm bearing fruit in every good work. Bearing fruit. Now there's all kinds of fruit. Now here he says bearing fruit in every good work, but there's the fruit of our lips, the fruit of conversation. Uh, Hebrews chapter, uh, I think it's 13, that says the praise of our lips is pleasing to him. There's the fruit of conversion. Imagine when you go out and you lead someone to Christ. There's the fruit of righteousness. There's the fruit of the Spirit. There's all kinds of fruit. But he says bearing fruit. Now, if I were to go into the Gospels class and I were to say, help me turn to a chapter in the Gospels that talks about bearing fruit, where would I go to? Galatians, that'd be a good one, but in the Gospels, not the Epistles, the Gospels. Where would I go? That talks about abiding in Christ. John 15, yes, yes, you win the star for the day. 
John 15 talks about abiding in Christ. Well, you know what he talks about? He talks about bearing fruit. He talks about those who have fruit, those who have more fruit, those who have much fruit, those who have bearing fruit, those who have lasting fruit. So in your life, are you bearing fruit? Well, you might say, well, yeah. Then I would say, well, are you bearing more fruit or are you bearing much fruit? Which one is it? Well, <clears throat> here he's talking about bearing fruit. You know, when we bear fruit, we're walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. Wow. I'm pleasing him and everything. I'm bearing fruit in every good work in my life. Notice third. Anybody in verse 10 see another ING ending? What is it? Increasing. Increasing in the knowledge of God. Oh man, don't you just love that? Increasing. Today is May 1st. Now if I were to go back last month when I was here, my question to you today is, have you increased in your knowledge of God in the last month? Or have you just been stagnant? To increase in the knowledge of God, what would be some ways that I could do that? Class? Read the Word. Read the word. What else? Pray. Pray. Let's just take that read the Word. Read the Word. You need to do that. I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot, but does anybody here read through the Bible in a year? Like a program type thing? Good. Good. Oh, good. Good for you. Shame on the rest of you. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Read the scriptures. We have to read. But listen, reading is great because it helps us get the big picture of the Bible. But you need to do more than read. You need to do what else? Obey. Obey. Yeah, you need to obey the scriptures. I can read it, but if I don't obey it, what? I need to read it, but I also need to study it. I need to dig into it. Now, I'm not sure this is maybe my fourth time here and you've gotten an outline each time I've come. And I hope by now you probably understand it. I'm trying to help you study the scriptures. The outline is a means of here's one way to do a passage. You can outline it out. It's a form. It's not the only form. There's many. But this is a way. And my, my desire is to give you something that will help you this week to help you study the scriptures and say, okay, this is the launching pad. This gives me a basis. Now I can take this, hopefully, and go deeper into this. I can look at these participles. I can go home and get on Google and say, what is a participle? <laughs> and look at what that means and dig into it. So we have pleasing in all respects. I have bearing fruit in every good work. I'm increasing in the knowledge of God. Verse 11, reading out of the New American, it says, strengthened with all power. Literally, the, again, the Greek is being strengthened. And so I've written in my side there, B-I-N-G, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of steadfastness and patience. It goes on. Being strengthened. Are you being strengthened in your life? Do you find yourself as you get older, you're being strengthened in the word of God. You're being strengthened by your brothers and sisters in Christ. Being strengthened. You see, all of these are what? They're helping me walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. If you don't know what that means, it basically is when you walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, you're doing these five participles. That's, that's what it means. And so for me, I am praying for you that you might be filled with the knowledge of God's will. It's not really too hard to understand God's will. Sometimes he's very specific about it. For example, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, listen to what Paul says. For this is the will of God. I love those kind of verses. <laughs> Did you ever say, boy, you know, I just don't know what God's will is for my life. Hello, you know, here's, here's one of those passages that just says, for this is the will of God. What is it? Your sanctification. What does that mean? That you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel. And he goes on, this is the will of God. I know that. There's other passages like that. Praying that we would know the will of God. Well, I come to my fifth participle. Down in verse 12. 
Anybody have an ing ending in verse 12? Giving. giving, yes, giving thanks. Now, look at your Bible. Some of you have different things. Take the word joy, joyously, whatever it is there that's at the end of verse 11. Is your word joy in your translation, is it connected to patience or is it connected to thanks in verse 12? Thanks? Does anybody have in verse 11, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience with joy or with joy with patience? All right. Patience and long suffering, but is joy connected to that? With joy. With joy. But I'm reading out of the New American and it says this For the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, semicolon. Then my verse 12, or excuse me, the last word of verse 11 is joyously, then a verse 12, giving thanks. You see, depending on what translation you have, it changes it a little bit. Because some of your translation says the joy is with patience, but mine says joyously giving thanks. Now, since I'm preaching, I'm right. <laughs> no, not really. But we're going to use my translation this morning. Because I do happen to think that in the, in the context, and I know that you're well aware, in the Greek language, there's no punctuation. The words just run on. There's no, there's no divisions. There's no breaks. There's no punctuation. And so our English, obviously our English translators, some of the translations that you have, they put the word joy with patience. And sometimes that makes sense when you think of all those uh, martyrs who've gone before us, all those prophets who died, and they did so with joy, being burned at the stake and singing. That makes sense. But here in our context, it seems like the New American, I think, has it right, where they say, joyously giving thanks to the Father. And that's really what I want to talk about this morning. See, that's been all introduction. What time is it? <laughs> Joyously giving thanks. The last ING ending is giving thanks. You know, when, when I give thanks and when you give thanks and you joyously give thanks, that is a means to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. When you joyously give thanks, I believe that's pleasing to God in all aspects of your life. So joyously giving thanks. So what do we give thanks for? Now notice, here's where we come to my main point today in preparation for communion. I hope that as we've gathered together in just a few moments, we're going to take of these elements. And I, I want you to just think of your life. Are you joyously giving thanks to the Father? Why would we do that? Paul spells it all out. Look what he says. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. You know, at one point, I just have to step back and look at my life and say, wow, I know that there was a day where I was not qualified. I was a sinner. I was lost. I was condemned. I was dead in my trespasses and sins. And God, my Father, had to qualify me. I know you know that I, I do interim pastoral work at Sprig. Uh, off of I-90, west of Spokane. And I had a funeral yesterday. And, uh, you know, I was trying to tell people that, you know, when you're dead, you cannot respond to anything, right? I mean, no matter how it goes, that person in that casket is not responding by preaching. I'm preaching my heart out on 1 Corinthians 15, and I'm waiting for that dead person to say, Preach it, brother! <laughs> They're not going to do that. They're dead. They cannot respond. And as we come to this, he says, He has qualified us. There was a time where you and I could not inherit anything in heaven because we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We had no hope. We're not seeking after God. There's no one that does good. There's no one righteous, not even one. And so Paul says, joyously giving thanks to the Father who, and actually again, literally, there's an ING ending here. It's having qualified. Who having qualified us to share in the inheritance of saints and lights. I rejoice over that. As I come to communion this morning, my heart is joyously giving thanks because my Father has qualified me. Because I wasn't. 
by His grace, by His mercy, He's qualified me to share in the inheritance. Wow. A little over two weeks ago, I had a mild heart attack. Yeah. They took me to the hospital. I was there. They did all kinds of things, angiograms, all those kind of things. And he said, yeah, you're having some problems. Fortunately for me, it's the electrical part, not the plumbing part. So all my arteries and stuff, that was all clear. But that top part of my heart was having a short, all those kind of things. And so it really shook me up. And they wanted to admit me and keep me overnight. But I said, I live with a nurse, my youngest daughter. She lives in the same house. And the doctor who worked on me and the nurses who took care of me, they know my daughter because I was at Sacred Heart. She's a nurse at Sacred Heart. She worked with all these people. And uh, so finally I convinced the doctor to let me go home because I have my own personal nurse. And he knew Hannah and he said, yep, that's okay. But it's sharing an inheritance. And it was there that they started talking to me about, do you have a will? Do you have a power of attorney? Do you have all those kind of things? Do I have an inheritance to leave to my kids? You know, I'm joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified me to share in the inheritance that yet awaits me. What a joy, what a blessing for that. Then he goes on. Notice secondly, he says in verse 13, for, or literally, who rescued us from the domain of darkness. He rescued us from the domain of darkness. You know, we need to understand, I wasn't qualified. If I'm being rescued, that means I'm in a situation where it's not good. But he rescued, what did he rescue us from? The domain of darkness. The domain of darkness. April was Titanic month. Did you know that? Back in April 12th to the 15th, it was 110 years ago where the Titanic sank. And so I I have become fascinated with the Titanic. And so for the month of April, I've been spending getting articles and photographs and all kinds of things of the Titanic. And as I was studying this, he rescued us from the domain of darkness. And I, boy, I just thought so much of all of those who were on on that ship. And that night when they hit that iceberg, And within a matter of hours, that huge luxury liner was gone. And as I was reading some of the testimonies by the survivors, and I was looking at some of the pictures, thinking, wow. And imagine that night as as that ship began to sink in, in the bow, all of those compartments that began taking on water. And from one compartment to the next, because they weren't capped to the top, it began seeking over. And that ship began to list, and it began to sink, and, and it would come back up. And pretty soon it got to that point, as boats were being lowered off the sides. And you can just almost imagine the, the chaos, the noise, the shouts, the noise of the metal and stuff on that ship. And, and finally, that last, as it began to dip underneath, And they say that the Titanic literally stood upright. The bow, or the stern being upright. And I mean, you can just, I can't even imagine. You can't be on that upright hanging on and just all the things that were going on. And finally, as that big ship began going down and the chimneys began to break off and it began going down under, And just imagine all the shouting and the crying and the screaming and the people in the water. And some of the accounts said that as that ship went under the water, as it was going down, they could hear it breaking apart. And you know, it broke in half. And they said you could hear that as it was going down. I don't know what that is, three miles down the bottom. And imagine now the noise that that made. And now it's down, gone below. And yet there's crying, there's sobbing. There's people screaming in the water. There's people clinging, the moaning and the groaning. And finally, there comes a moment when then it all stops. And it's all dead quiet in the darkness of that night. The moanings, the groanings have now all kind of faded away. 
Those who tried to cling to little things have now frozen. Hypothermia slipped off. And there in the domain of darkness were some people, 700 people in lifeboats that were rescued the next morning from the Carpathia. And I look at that and I read that. and I mean, it just gripped my heart just thinking, oh, man, I can't imagine. I can't imagine those who had to stay behind. I can't imagine those who were knowing they're going to die and some who willingly gave their boats to others. And we have what Paul says, joyously giving thanks to the Father who rescued us from the domain of darkness. No, beloved, what you and I have been rescued from is far worse than those who were on the Titanic. The domain, the authority of darkness that we were rescued from is from hell. Right? That God rescued us out of the grips of that. When the Carpathia was docked, and I'm not sure how many days afterwards, but there were some who were standing on the side of this rescue ship, and as they were looking out, they could see all these white seagulls or something coming in and all these things out there, and finally it dawned on somebody. These were dead bodies now coming in to the shore. I think there was like 128 that they just saw out on the horizon, and pretty soon as the tide began bringing these bodies in, and for weeks as the search vessels went out, they were finding those who perished. This morning as you come to communion, I want you to joyously give thanks to the Father who rescued you from the domain of darkness if you're saved. Your heart ought to be rejoicing to think, that's not me. That rescue ship that God brought to me by Jesus Christ and he saved my soul out of the authority is what the word really means, the authority of darkness. That's a lot to rejoice about. It's somber to think of where we could have been. It's somber to think of those who are lost. And I can just share that to say, there are people in Kettle Falls and Colville and Evans and all around us, Marcus, that are lost just like that Titanic. And they're sinking and swimming in the cold North Atlantic waters of the authority of darkness that we need to share the gospel to. Then he goes on. He rescued us from the domain of darkness and then he transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Not only did he just rescue us from the darkness, but now he's transferred us to a great place. (laughs) He saved us out of that authority of darkness and now to the kingdom. If you notice some of these phrases, verse 12, the inheritance. Verse 13, the domain. Verse 13, the kingdom. Underline those, mark those, study those out uh, this week when you're Growing in your knowledge of of God. (laughs) Study those phrases out. He's transferred us. Hallelujah, I've been transferred. Not just rescued. I wasn't just rescued out of the pit of darkness, but he transferred me to the White House. (laughs) He's put me into the great places where I'm going to be spending eternity in heaven. Man. Now we come to verse 13. Excuse me, verse 14 in whom, in his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption. We have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. What time do I need to be done? Whenever you <laughs> All right. We've been redeemed. We've been rescued. We've been redeemed. Redemption simply means to release on payment. To release on payment of ransom. The two words that Paul is using here, they go together, rescue and redeemed. We're visually reminded on the news as we watch sometimes of people who are being held, by, being held captive by their captors. They're demanding a ransom payment. And sometimes we even see that rescue attempt that leads to their deliverance. Notice, first of all, the word implies that someone is captive and a captor. Notice your two C's on your outline. To be redeemed means there must be a captive and a captor. 
one of us. If there is to be a release, it's used twice in the New Testament, this word captive. It's used in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26, Luke chapter 5, verse 10. The word means capture alive. Satan and sin are the captors. We are the captives. We are redeemed to be released on payment of ransom. Secondly, someone, the Father, must make the payment the ransom. Notice in verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who is the Father has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, who the Father has rescued us from the domain of darkness, and the Father has transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Do you see the workings together, the Father and Son? The Father has rescued us. The Father has transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom, in whom in the beloved, the Son, we have redemption. The rescuer is the one who paid the ransom price, and the ransom price was the blood of His Son. Our rescue was by means of our redemption, meaning our rescue was by means of the ransom that the Father paid for us. Do you realize that when we come to communion this morning, we are coming in recognition of the ransom that has been paid by the Father for us, by the blood of Jesus Christ. When you and I, in just a moment, we're going to take that juice and we're going to remember the blood of Jesus Christ that's the ransom that was paid. The body is the person of Jesus Christ. The Father offered the ransom. You and I have been bought. He paid that price. As captives, we have been set free. And so as you look at this, there needs to be a ransom, a price paid. And that is in the person of His beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 3 and verse 24 being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Our redemption is in Christ Jesus. The reason we're here this morning is because we've been redeemed. There's some old hymns I love to sing. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Any of you ever sing that old hymn? I've been redeemed. What does that mean? It means God the Father paid a ransom price for me to take me out of the domain of darkness. <laughs> I'm no longer there. I've been transferred to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom He's redeemed me by His blood. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In Him, in Christ, in the beloved, we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses. Now, I know I'm among saints this morning who've never trespassed. Yeah, I know, that's sarcastic. Because according to Scripture, it's through His blood the forgiveness of our trespasses. No other price would be sufficient. The only price that would and will effectively release the captives is the blood of Jesus Christ. The death of Jesus Christ in His shed blood is the only saving grace to those being held captive by Satan and sin. Oh, beloved, I don't know what you're seeking, who you're seeking, but there's no one else that can save you other than Jesus Christ. It's only by His blood that man can be saved. Nothing else is going to do it. If you're here this morning thinking just because you came to church, you're going to find good grace in God's eyes, you're wrong. <laughs> the only way you're going to get to heaven is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18-19, and 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. That's what we're here to celebrate this morning. That's what we're here to remember, that blood of Christ, His body. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of, his, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. This morning, 
If you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've been cleansed by the blood of all sin. And beloved, that's past, present, and future. Does it give me a license to go out and sin like the devil because my sin's been forgiven? No, it doesn't. But he has saved us. He has forgiven us. He has cleansed us. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. To him, to Jesus Christ, who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. I love those verses. I have been released from my sins by his blood. Have I ever sinned before? Oh man, royally. That has been forgiven. Past, present, and future. A payment of ransom must be made. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Be on your guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which He purchased, literally, which He acquired with His own blood. Again, the reminder, you and I have been bought. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You see on your outline, we've been rescued. We've been redeemed. And thirdly, we've been released in verse 14. The forgiveness of sins. A literal rendering of this verse would read this way. In whom we have the redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. There's a definite correlation, a definite connection between redemption and forgiveness of sins. As you look at all of this, once the price, once the the ransom has been paid, our Father can forgive us of our sin, and sin therefore no longer holds us captive. You and I, we've been released from its eternal and damning grip on us. Forgiveness involves removal of our sins. As far as the east is from the west, we've been released through that blood of Christ. Micah chapter 7, verse 19, He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast out all their sins into the depths of the sea. I know when they wrote that, they didn't have any understanding of how deep the sea was. Those of you who were here from way back when I first gave my message in Isaiah chapter 40, and we were talking about that great big deep ditch in the sea. Anybody remember what that was? The Mariana Trench, so deep. And I just always imagine as I read these kind of verses, that says, their sin I've cast into the depths of the sea. I like to just imagine my sins have been cast so far down into the very depths of the Mariana Trench. Do you know they have these little robots now that go down there? And they got these little cameras. And so you can actually go on and you can see that. And somehow, I don't mean to make fun of this, but somehow I just kind of imagine this little machine going down there. And one day they're going to be going down there. And there's my sins down there (laughs) at the depths of the sea. I know that's not true, but the idea of Scripture is my sins are where no man can ever get them, where we will never see them again. They've been gone. Released through the blood. Secondly, this R on your outline, put the word remember. Remembers no longer our sin. As I study things theologically, I think I can wrap my my mind around the fact that I've been released from my sins. But of all the aspects of forgiveness, I think this is the one that for me just boggles my mind. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 4. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Take that verse Is that on your outline? It is. Go home and study that. Mark that. 
where he says, I will remember your sin no more. I just can't hardly get my mind around that. I know the wickedness of my own heart. I know my past. And the fact to think that God in his mind, his heart, however that works, the fact that he doesn't even remember my sin anymore. Because of my advocate, Jesus Christ, because of his intercession on my behalf, because I've been released, because of all these things that Paul is writing here, the fact that he doesn't even remember my sin. Don't you wish that was true of us? Don't you wish somehow you could no longer remember so-and-so's sin? Maybe somebody did something to you and that sin still sticks in your mind. Yes, I've forgiven them, but you know, we, we remember that. He doesn't remember. Isaiah chapter 43, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Isaiah 44, I've wiped out your transgressions like a thick cloud and your sins like a heavy mist. I've done away with them. I won't even remember them anymore. In whom we have redemption. Means he's wiped out our sins. He's removed them. Never to be seen again. And even no longer remembers our sin. We have the special joy and the privilege to come to communion this morning. All of this has been to bring us here. Let's be sure to give thanks. Not just to give thanks, but like the New American Standard, giving thanks. Joyously giving thanks to the Father for His rescuing us from the domain and the authority of darkness and transferring us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, in whom we have the forgiveness of sins, where we've been released from our sins, where He doesn't even remember our sins anymore. He's removed them as far as the east is from the west. Secondly, <clears throat> may we never forget we have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Do you want to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord? Then glorify your Father in your body. This week, do that. I'm going to ask those who are going to serve us communion.